The photos that I'm sharing on screen now show a before and after of a recent shoot for a kitchen designer. We can see the quality improvement from the in-camera capture to the final deliverable to the client. But before we can get our photos polished up and back to our client, we need to get organized. Whatever your finishing method is in post-production, whether it's HDR, Flambient, a combination of those things, the likelihood is you'll be taking a series of images from any one camera location. And dealing with that vast amount of photographic imagery can be overwhelming. And so that's the topic of this video. How can we best organize our imagery from our architectural or real estate photo shoots? If you do this or want to do this professionally, over the years, the amount of photographs that you accumulate will just seriously stack up. And so having a system for staying organized with your project is vitally important. Hopefully half an hour spent with me here in this video will save you multiple hours over the lifetime of your career as an architectural or real estate photographer. If you're also interested in the post-production techniques that I use to take the photos from raw in-camera capture through to those finished, more polished proofs that you saw before, I'll be sharing that video on my architectural photography specific channel. And really that's where you need to be watching this type of content. So if you haven't subscribed to that channel already, please pause this video, jump over to there. There's a link in the description below. Go to that channel. If architectural photography, real estate photography is your thing, that's where you need to be for all of this kind of content. But if you are content to miss out on that video and future architectural photography videos that I post, by all means, watch the content here and let's get into it. So yesterday I was out on a photo shoot for a kitchen designer and you can see here, this is one set of proofs that I've already sent through to the designer. We've got a little bit of detail work. We've got some overall shots and I've sent through to them 29 proofs. So 29 different options for them to select from. So before I go ahead and do any of the heavy lifting inside of Photoshop, refining these photos, I've done what I consider to be a very efficient edit on these photos, which has enabled me to get all 29 of these photographs back to the client very quickly so that they can just assess the photos and say yes or no as to whether or not they actually want to pay for a license to use these photos. Because I'm not going to go to the hard work of finessing this photo beyond what it needs to be if the client comes back and doesn't even select this one. This whole set of photos to narrow this down from what you see here as 145 shots that were actually taken down to 29 photos that I can send through. That probably took me about half an hour. So if I open up one of these bracketed sets here, you'll actually see the original photo captures that my camera was capturing so that you can see that I have all the detail for the very brightest highlights in this image. So I've got detail for that little light there and the sky if I need it, right through to a much brighter photograph where I can incorporate the interior, including the kitchen here, which is obviously a very important part for the kitchen designer. But the key point is that before I go to work on all seven of these these files, merging them into one really nice exposure blend and retouching it. I just want to get something back to the client really nice and quickly. So how do we get our set of photos into a well-organized, stacked and renamed collection so that we're ready to do that post-production? So let's switch over to the library module just by pressing the G key. And the first thing I do is select all my photos, which brings up the rename dialog box. I come to the file naming box here and come to edit. And this is stage one of my naming process, but the concept will make sense once you've seen the whole process. So first of all, I do a hyphen followed by my client's name, followed by a reference for the job. I then check how many photos I've taken, in this case 246. So I know that I have to include a three digit number as an identifier. So I come to the sequence and date section and I choose a three digit sequence. And so once I click done and I start at number one and click OK, Lightroom will rattle through applying that name to this whole set of images. But as I say, this is just part one of the naming convention and we'll come back to the second round of naming conventions once I've actually grouped these into their bracketed sets. And as you can see, when when I'm on site, I'm shooting my base exposure and then I'm shooting a bracketed set of five. So on a tripod, I'm shooting one shot. This was based on what the camera thought was the correct exposure. And as you can see, this is far too dark. And I did realize that whilst I was doing my initial sets and I reshot this sequence with what I deemed to be the correct exposure as the starting point. And then with auto bracketing set on my camera, that's followed up with an exposure which is two stops darker, one stop darker, and then one stop brighter than that original shot, and then two stops brighter than the original shot. And the purpose of shooting a bracketed series is literally CYA. 
cover your ass. Based on the histogram in the top right here, we can see that yes, we absolutely have all the luminosity data that we need to actually bring out all the details in the shadow and the highlights. So in this case, we don't need all these extra additional shots. However, for example, let's say we wanted to bring up a lot of detail in the front door here. It's getting very dark. We have this image here where the shadows on the door are going to be so much cleaner. And if we wanted to, we could actually use elements from this frame, including the door here and other shadow areas to actually combine with that initial exposure where it's much darker. If you're wondering why the blinds are all tilted, you can just about see out here, they're actually having construction work done. The client's actually having concrete put around the exterior of the house. This was literally a building site when I turned up here. And so I had workmen in high-vis vests wandering back and forth. We had a digger just out of shot here, digging away. And so it really wasn't ideal conditions for actually capturing this kitchen. However, my client wants to enter these photos into the Kitchen Design Awards that are coming up in less than a week. And so waiting for a more appropriate day to the shoot just wasn't an option. I'm going to press G on my keyboard just to come back to grid view inside of Lightroom. I'm also going to press T which will get rid of the toolbar here and that's just going to give us a little bit more real estate to work with. I can get rid of the filter bar by pressing the backslash key and pressing shift F will toggle through different screen modes. One thing I love about Lightroom is there's hotkeys for just about anything. So I'm just going to minimize that fly out on the left hand side there. Just so we can see in thumbnail view what I captured. I'll just make them just a little bit bigger for you just so you can see them a bit better. And as I scroll through, hopefully you'll get a sense of the kitchen space, the photos that I took. And you will also see from the very rough and ready sort of nature of these images at the moment, just how much work we've got to do to make them look good and acceptable for delivery to the client for that initial proofing stage. Absolutely, we're going to improve them further in Photoshop once they've made their selections. But for now, here you can see the photos that I've taken. You can see some detail shots that I've taken with a telephoto just to try and complement those more overall photos. And here's one that's going to be a little more challenging to combine, which is an exterior with the interior. And this is a good example to demonstrate the difficulties we face when we're photographing both the exterior of a home and the interior in one shot or vice versa when you're looking out of the window. That's where all of our lovely exposure blending, HDR techniques, other things that I've shared on this channel come into play. Whereas initially I was shooting a set of five images. In this case, if I select these and then press N on the keyboard, you can see that I've actually got a set of seven. So when there is a greater contrast in the scene like there is here, it always pays, like I say, just to cover your ass and make sure that when you get back in front of the computer, you don't realize that you've missed the opportunity to get the correct exposure. So absolutely the top end one is overexposed. The bottom end one is underexposed and more than likely my bracketed set of five, which would have excluded that one and the one on the top end, this would have been adequate. However, I just say play it safe. When you're doing a professional gig, just make sure that you're capturing all the frames that you need. And with that in mind, I'm always considering, yes, I could use luminosity blending to uh, combine the best of those five photos and come out with something very usable. But to further improve my chances of success in post-production, I've also captured some variations where I've used off-camera strobe as well. And so I'm just firing my flash straight up into the alcove of the ceiling here, and it's just bouncing into the scene here. And yes, absolutely, this smacks of a frame that has been taken with the addition of flash. However, the fact that I have my naturally lit bracketed set plus these additional shots where I've been moving around with my off-camera strobe, and you can see me doing that just here. For my finished image, I've got post-processing options, and that's what I love. You want to make sure that you get back in front of your computer with all the raw data you need at your fingertips. So now you guys have seen the photos that I collected on site. I'm going to press G, so I'm back into my grid view. And now we're going to start bunching these together into their respective stacks. And you can either do that manually or set Lightroom up to do it automatically. And I really don't mind doing it either way, to be honest, because there are pros and cons to each, and I'll discuss those. So what I would do manually is to select the first one in a series and click on the last one, shift click, so that we select the whole series. And then we just press Control G, to group those and now we have a group stack with the mid exposure on the top. However, this is the first shot of the day. I'm just warming up and that exposure is actually too dark. Same again for this second set here. So if I group both of those, these are basically ripe for the bin. But let's say this third set that I've got here, when I group those, now we're in the right place. We've got what I would deem to be a pretty good base exposure sat on top of the stack. 
But let's suppose that my first frame wasn't what I consider to be the best exposure. So if I come back to grid mode and we select the next set, if you press N on the keyboard, that will show you your selected images. Although this was the first exposure and therefore my middle exposure of five in the bracketed set, I actually feel that this image here is a much better base exposure. So now with all five selected, yet this photo is the one that I've highlighted and now I press Control G to group those together, it's now the most accurate exposure, the best one which is sat on the top of the group. And that's what we want and that's one of the primary reasons why I like doing this manually. And there's a couple of other good things that come about by doing this approach. One is that you get to know your photos. As you're going through these and batching them together, you start to actually get a feel for the photos that you've taken. And the second useful thing that can often go unnoticed when you use Lightroom's automated feature is mistakes. So for example, in this one, I'm reaching up and I'm pulling the light fixture, which you can just see the corner of here, trying to pull that out of frame. And you can just see a little bit of my shirt there. So there's an erroneous frame that really needs to be going in the bin. And if it's stacked up with something else on top of it, I may not actually see that and I may not realize it until the client selects this photo. And this is one of the photos that exist in the batch. I come to do the editing. I'm might want to use this frame and all of a sudden oh hang on my big old elbows in the way that's no good or in the case of the example we were looking at just before you can see that that digger that I spoke of before he's just come into frame right there so this frame although exposure wise this is very useful the fact that the digger is showing up here isn't ideal and the set that I've got before we have no digger so although this exposure is much better here I know that in this bracketed set I have a usable section for the windows without that stupid digger in the way also, when you go through this process manually and you're looking at your photos, your memory gets jogged to things, such as if I select both of these and I pressed N, in spite of the digger right here, I do need to keep this set. And the reason is the door to the pantry is now closed. And the kitchen designer said, this is quite an important feature. The fact that we have a pantry around the back of the kitchen, yet when the door is closed, you wouldn't even know it's there. And so these two photos act as a kind of before and after, and the client may end up purchasing both of these photos. So to us, we've just doubled our income. We're getting paid for both photos, and the only difference is one has a door open, one has a door closed. Before I commit the time into making videos, it's really useful to gauge interest and are people actually interested in a particular topic. So if you guys want to learn more about the pricing aspects of architectural photography, how and why I charge a licensing fee for my individual photos rather than charging a fee for the whole shoot, if you'd like me to elaborate more on that, just write pricing in the comments so I can gauge the interest. Okay, so we've looked at how we can manually stack the bracketed photos together, but what about automation? Can Lightroom do this for us? Well, absolutely it can. I've pressed Shift F there so that I can get access to my toolbar here. And from the photo drop down here, I'm just gonna come down to stacking. And the very last option in stacking is auto stack by capture time. And here this allows us to automatically stack our photos. So all we need to do here is just make sure that the time that we set is longer than the longest time between the shutter going off in any bracketed set. So for example, if the longest exposure within a set is one second and you have one second between the shutter going in your series of five, then you need to make sure that this number is larger than two seconds. But you also don't want to set it too high. And as I pull this down to the left, you'll see that the number of stacks created changes. And so we want this automation to grab as many of the photos as we can and put them into their correct stack without grabbing additional photos that shouldn't actually exist within that stack. And so for this upper number here, that time needs to be less than the time between the end of one bracketed set and the start of the next bracketed set. Sounds a little confusing, but if you think about it, you get your head around it. For me, the default time of eight seconds is a pretty good compromise because in some instances, I also use off-camera flash as part of a sequence and that needs to be stacked up as well. That means that that particular sequence will actually be longer. And so for that reason, the auto feature will often leave a few stragglers that I'll later need to go in and batch, but at least it gets us a lot closer. It's gonna do 45 stacks for us if we leave these settings as they are. If I press G and have a little scroll through here, you will see that we now have lots of sets of five images with a few stragglers. So for example, this shot here also needs to be combined with the flash shots like this, all into one stack. And so in that case, all I need to do is click on the very last image that should be in the stack, hold shift and click on the stack itself. Make sure that we've highlighted the photo that we want to be on the top of the stack. And then we just press control G. And now we have a stack of nine that includes those five bracketed set. 
So this automation has got us pretty close, but as I say, there are still a few stragglers, such as this guy here and this dude. Here's another reason why the automation feature isn't always that great, and that is we have our set here of bracketed images, which Lightroom's automated into one stack. Lovely. Now we have these stragglers that I captured with the purpose of better color accuracy and also illuminating certain areas, like the end of the waterfall bench top here. I bounced the light onto the ceiling of the adjacent room, and that's just softly lit that. But the first of these four images, this one here, there is no additional off-camera flash. This is a nothingness photo, and really this just needs to be deleted and doesn't need to be part of that stack. And sometimes with auto stacking, random frames like that get missed, and then you end up with redundant files cluttering up your hard drive that you just didn't need in the first place. Whereas when you do it manually, and you do it not too long after the shoot as well, so everything's fresh in your mind, you know that that's an image for the bin where the off-camera flash that you were supposed to have firing didn't fire. So anyway, I'm just going to press Control G to group those strobed shots onto the back end of this stack. And I'll press G to go back to my grid view. And I'm just going to work through with the stacking process. But what I do at the same time as doing my stacking is I select stacked groups that I know are for the bin. So for example, these two here, I've already established that the base exposure and therefore the other bracketed sets, it's all too dark. Whereas this one here was much better. So I know that I improved this original set and I can throw the original sets into the bin. And rather than deleting them individually as I go, what I like to do is just literally pick them up throw them in a reject folder, and then when I get to the end, I can just select this whole folder and delete it just in one go. If you'd like to see how I do a quick proof edit on these photos and get them back to my client nice and quickly, stay tuned till the end of the video where I'll put up a link for part two of this video where we cover that side of the post-production. Okay, we have some vertical options here, so let me select those and do a quick comparison. The first of the four here is slightly tighter, and these three are all identical in terms of the actual composition and framing. The only difference is I'm stretching up to the ceiling and trying to move the light out of the way. And by the looks of things, I failed pretty miserably. At least that's what you'd think. However, my intention for the final image is not to have this as a two by three ratio. What my intention is, is to have a four by five. Therefore losing that little bit of light up in the top of the frame anyway. So I'm not too worried that the fact that it is still showing there in these frames, that's fine. So the fact that this one has less light, but has me in the corner of it, I know this one's for the bin. And I obviously did something wrong in this first set as well. Oh no, that first set's pretty good. So let's just select those two, make sure we're staying in our library view and just throw those in the rejects. The fact that we have two very, very similar shots here, ultimately I may end up just supplying one of these to the client because I don't really like them having too many decisions to make. If they're umming and ahhing between too many photos, they're likely to get decision fatigue. And as any psychologist will tell you, that is not a good thing when you're wanting somebody to make a buying decision. And so with that in mind, I'm gonna grab this shot here, which is slightly tighter, and I'm gonna throw that away. Now this is an interesting point because I actually preferred the slightly tighter shot. So why have I thrown it away? Well, I know for a fact that I was going to have to actually straighten the file up slightly. So if I come to the transform section and just click auto and now crop that to the four by five ratio that I was after, I've actually just got a little bit of wiggle room in terms of my actual final crop. Whereas when you've cropped too tightly in camera, sometimes those more creative cropping decisions that you might want to make after the event just aren't available to you. And so although this is now a tighter crop, I've actually been able to do that more accurately, counterintuitively, because I'm working on a photo that I actually photographed wider. Hmm, go figure that one out. Okay, let's carry on. The fact that we have some heinous barrel distortion going on at the moment, I'm not worried about. I'm gonna fix all of that up. And for examples like this one, where we have the lights on here and off here, the cabinetry lighting is very much a feature, and so this is what I want to supply as a proof. But I'm also gonna keep this series connected to this photo, so Control G to group those all together, so that I have the option, if the client chooses this base image here, I can steal from any of my images, the ones I captured with flash, the ones that I've taken in natural lighting without any lights on. I've got post-production options, and that's what I want to bring out the best in my file. Same here, tripod didn't move, and so I've got all of these shots here which are available to me. I've got flashed ones at the end, we've got some taken with lights on, lights off, and I'm just gonna select the one that I prefer, press Control G, 16 potential photos I can call on to create a finished image, but for now the client only needs to see one, and as I said about that barrel distortion, don't panic, I am gonna fix all of that up. 
Okay, base exposure here compared to the next one, underexposed. So I'll select that, drag it into rejects. These two photos are looking very similar indeed. And if I just select one, flick to the next one. Okay, there we can see the difference. It wasn't immediately obvious to me. It was the door closing again. So these are actually two files I actually want to keep because again, the client may say, I want one with the door closed and the door open so I can show before and after. I've then had a play around with the lighting, turned some of the lights on, and in the next one we've got all of the lights on. And again, these are just options for me. The client doesn't even need to know that they exist at the moment, and so I'm just gonna shift click all of these, make sure that the one selected is the photo that I want on the top, press Control G, and they're all grouped together. These next five are ones that I shot with the flash, where potentially I can steal just certain areas where I want the lighting. But rather than concern myself with overthinking that at this point, all I'm going to do is just throw them into this stack. Here we have two images shot from exactly the same angle. The only difference is the lighting. But again, I don't think I need to be giving the client the decision of do you want the lights on? Do you want the lights off? I'm just going to select those together, press Ctrl G and we're grouped. And one of the reasons why I'm not too concerned about showing the one with the lights here is the fact that I know very well that I did another option in a horizontal format where we've got all the lighting on. And we have a very slight difference here and this is something you need to be mindful of is if there is interior lighting and you're trying to showcase it have you actually got it all on like if i flip back to the one before somehow i'd missed the switch to turn this one on whereas i caught it thankfully and managed to get that on in the next shot and so this series here can just go straight in the reject bin in this photo compared to the one before i've gone for a very distinctive look and thankfully the client actually had some blackout blinds to the left of camera here and so i was effectively able to block all of the light except for what we had just going on outside the blinds and that enabled me to get a very distinct look from what we had before and in this case absolutely i'm going to give the client the option of a or b or potentially both oftentimes when i'm doing a series of images sometimes i set up a composition on my tripod and rattle off a series of images and then something catches my eye so if we have a look just down here there were some cloths we'd used for cleaning and they were still there and so in that case i need to do a whole nother set of images and that's fine that's where we come to grab that initial bracketed set and just throw it in the bin interestingly lightroom has stacked eight images here rather than the five so i'm going to open this up and just have a look and here we go as we look at the option on the left and on the right there's not much in terms of lighting difference the only difference would be that very minuscule drop in lighting between the two is literally what's going on outside of the property nothing else has changed the reason that we have eight photos here is because these are the ones where i'd gone around and used the off-camera flash and we'd already stacked those up so with that in mind i know that that's the series i want to keep and this one here can go straight in the bin in this shot the client wanted to feature the end of the waterfall here and the fact that the vein runs up the marble here and along the bench top so i showed my client while we were there and we agreed on site that the initial camera angle was too low to really showcase the top of the bench and so i just made a slight adjustment there brought the camera up to a higher angle and now i know that i can just basically grab these throw them in the bin and here we've got a lights on and a lights off option in this case i like the lights on option but i'm still going to keep the naturally lit environment and just make sure that's part of my stack to steal from those images if i need to later and in the next three series we're just playing around with lighting and you can actually see the marked difference between the first and the last one in terms of just playing with different lighting combinations so in this final one i just turned the lounge lights on and that illuminated the end of this waterfall bench top and because this is a feature, I don't want to go too dark on that. And so the first two options, again, I'm going to grab them, throw them in the rejects and keep this stack. This series here should never have happened. I was going off to actually grab my telephoto lens so I could do some detail shots. And I put my camera down on the tabletop here and it just fired off on its own. So again, we don't need those that can go in the rejects. And now we're on to some handheld single frame images. So I'm not bracketing. I'm just walking around holding my camera, no tripod. And I'm just looking for angles, looking for frames, picking out details that I think the client may be interested in. And so for these particular photos, they shouldn't actually be in a stack because they're all individual photos. They're all their own shot. And I just want to pick the best one out of these. So I'm just going to select all of those, come to photo stacking and remove from stack. So now with my hands on the arrow keys, I can just flick through these and I'm gonna actually use the P key to pick and move on from the photo I want to select. 
If you have the caps lock key on and you press P in this mode, you'll jump automatically to the next photo. But I don't really like working this way, so I'm gonna turn the caps lock off. And now when I pick a photo by pressing the P key, we don't move on to the next one until I press the arrow keys and I'm happy to move on. There's just subtle variations between these kind of shots and if I can make the decision of keeping one rather than the other, I will do, as I have here. Or in the case of the taps here, I think that the differences between the three photos that I've selected, where I have the difference of the flowers framed underneath the tap, removed from the shot entirely, so we've got a very clean image, or the flowers behind the left part of the tap and the water flowing out. Sometimes flicking one to the other doesn't really cut it for me, and so what I'll do is actually shift click all of them and cast my eye left to right, and the one that stands out as the best is the one that I will go ahead and pick. And as I mentioned, I'm hand holding these, so occasionally you get lines which aren't perfectly vertical or horizontal, but it's a trade off between me adding a lot of extra time on site where I'm doing everything on a tripod, or in this case, freestyling and getting all of these shots done really quickly. For example, correcting the geometry in Lightroom takes seconds, whereas if I'm setting this composition up on a tripod, I'm worrying about the height of the tripod, the angle of the head, all of that stuff, and that might take me a couple of minutes to do it on site, whereas I really prefer just freestyling with that telephoto lens, moving left and right, up and down, and then just making sure that everything's as parallel as it can be before taking the shot. Okay, these shots here of the lighting fixtures, I'm not really sure that they're gonna be of use to the designer, to be honest, so I'll just include a couple of those. And then we have a few images nicely straight on, going for a bit of symmetry there. This one includes a little bit more of the light underneath the bench top than that initial one. So in this instance, I'll send both through to the client and they can decide which one they want. I recall that the first two of these were just test images, so they are good for the bin. And this is one of the reasons why you should probably do this organizational work not too long after the shoot itself, so that things like that are fresh in your mind. So here's our group of seven bracketed images. Then we have a shot where I set in the base exposure before I started adding in the flash that I was walking around taking the shots like this. And so I know that this one, this test shot is good for the bin. And then if need be, there will be elements from different ones where I've used the off camera flash that I can incorporate into that final composite. And then I've got the option to add in certain elements from these off camera flash frames. I don't know which ones yet. I'm not gonna waste time thinking about, is this a relevant shot? Is it not? Is it good for the table? Um, do we like the transition between interior and exterior? I'm not going to worry about all that stuff at the moment. All I'm going to do is just throw that into that group set by going into the library, pressing Control G, and just making sure we have a representative shot that just sits on the very top. For the next step, I'm just going to get rid of all these dud photos. So I need to differentiate between the ones I don't want, like these two, and the ones I do. And I can't just come straight in at the moment and use my flag filter because those initial stacked series just aren't flagged as yet. And so what I'm gonna do is just quickly jump back to the grid view, scroll all the way to the top, and currently our stacks are all expanded. And so what I want to do is come down to photo stacking, and I'm gonna collapse all stacks. I'm gonna select the stacked options. And so I have the first one here, Scroll down to the last one before we start getting into the single frame details. And we wanna make sure we add this one as well. I'm going to right click and set the flag option to flagged. Now I know that everything I want to keep is flagged. I can come to the unflagged option, press Control A to select everything and drag all of that into the rejects. And now we have two distinct folders. We have a rejects folder, which currently contains the other shoot that I did, plus this one. And I'm not gonna throw these away just yet because I'm gonna keep them on file until I've delivered my finished images to the client just as a safety net because you never know. I may have made a mistake somewhere along the line where the client selects this photo and I don't realize that the exposure I want to use has that digger outside, for example. In which case I can jump back into my rejects and I should have another option there within the rejects folder. Okay, let's jump back into the selects. And now it's time to finish that naming convention so everything's really nicely organized. So the first thing I want to do is make sure that those stacks are all collapsed. Press G on my keyboard to come to the grid mode. And now you can see that we've whittled that set of photos down to a much more manageable number. Currently we have 31 different options. I expect the client to be selecting around 10 of these photos as their finished images. So along with the shoot fee, the licensing fee, this job will probably be worth about $1,600, $1,700 to me, plus any more if third parties want access to the photos, such as say the handle company, the draw runner company, 
there are options to license your work out to third parties, which is great. Another reason why I do licensing. And as I said before, if you wanna learn more about that, write pricing in the comments so that I can just gauge how much interest there is in that topic. Okay, let's finish our naming convention. Super easy now, we just press Control A to select all of our photos, press F2 so that we bring up the rename option, and we're gonna jump into the custom settings. We're gonna come down to edit, and we're gonna get rid of everything that we put before. We're gonna delete that, and instead, we're just gonna insert the file name. And so if I click done and clicked okay, basically nothing would change. All file names would be rendered exactly the same. This would be modern age Riley 011. But there's one thing I want to do, and that is create a numeric prefix that the client can use to reference the photos. Not this bit at the end, that was purely a numbering convention, just so that all 240 odd photos, whatever it was, all got an individual name and was relevant to the job. So when I'm importing different exposures from a bracketed set, they all refer to the client, they all refer to the job, it all makes sense. It's not the generic name that the camera applies to it. But we need something that the client can refer to. And I like to keep it really simple, just a two digit prefix. If I had over 100 photos, it would be three digit, but we've only got 31 photos here. So we need a sequence of two digits. My file name already started with that hyphen, so we're gonna get two digits, hyphen, and then the remainder of the file name. So I'm just gonna click done, click OK, and now satisfyingly our set of 31 photos have a much nicer naming convention. And even though I took multiple photos in between the exposures that are represented here, that important prefix that the client is gonna see is gonna be sequential, 01, 02, 03. So when I've finished my quick edit on these, exported them, the client can quickly come back to me with a list and just say, I would like 01, 03, 04, hopefully lots of photos from the shoot. And that's when I can go post-production beast mode, get the photos looking really Really great back to the client and I can be remunerated accordingly. I get it guys, having a strategy for organizing your photos isn't the most exciting topic. However, the follow-up video where I take those raw photos, put a bit of Lightroom polish on and get them back to the client so we can actually start earning our money, that video is shared over on my architectural photography channel. And if you're still watching this video, I think you're gonna get a lot of benefit from going over there and subscribing to that channel. Thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, please give me a thumbs up and certainly leave a comment and let me know what you thought. Cheers guys, see you in the next one.